So before we jump into older millennial trauma, I want to talk about To Be Better because you guys had recommended their channel to me and I didn't love it as much as I think some of you thought I was going to love it. And it took me a while to figure out why I didn't automatically like fall in love with their content. And I had been watching and watching and watching for the last like few days. I've literally been scrolling on TikTok and watching it with my partner and trying to figure out like what is it about their content that is like it, it sends like yellow flags up in my head. What is it? Now, obviously, you guys know that I establish an understanding that everyone lives in a bubble, myself included, and then that bubble informs us of our reality or we're having a relationship with our reality. And I know everyone has a different relationship with reality, but the relationship they're specifically having, I finally found out last night. I found this video and I was like, oh, that's what it is. That's what I found it. Okay, so now let's discuss it. I will also link to Be Better's TikTok, which has a lot of subscribers. They're very, very popular. Before I jump into this, to be better are real people with real feelings and they're having a real relationship with themselves. And I am in no way, shape or form saying that they are bad or saying that I don't like them or saying anything. I just don't relate to their work because of a very specific reason. Okay. And this is specific to Brittany and who she is and her journey. And so again, I am in no way, shape or form meaning to ruin anyone's reputation or talk ill of anybody. I just wanted to give you guys more insight into how my brain works and why I felt like there was a yellow flag circling around their content or their relationship, but in no way, shape or form am I saying like they're horrible people. Okay. So let's watch this video first to explain what made my brain go, oh, that's what it is, okay? Ladies, have you ever come across a man that says anything along the lines of like, oh my God, I can't believe you're talking to me. Oh my God, I can't believe I got you to go out with me. Leave him alone. That, that is the message, just leave him alone. Ladies, have you ever come across a man that says anything along the lines of like, oh my God, I can't believe you're talking to me. Oh my God, I can't believe I got you to go out with me. Leave him alone. That That is the message, just leave him alone. Okay, so just wanted to watch it. The audio is kind of low on her end. It's up on mine, but that's what we got from her audio. So basically I saw this and I was thinking like, oh, why does this remind me of a relationship? And it was reminding me of To Be Better's relationship. And I was like, oh, why does it remind me of their relationship? And then I saw this TikTok. <sighs> okay, again, this is their relationship and I am not trying to say anything bad about it, but this clip. It puts me on cloud nine when you refer to me as anything to you. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, the ownership? I just hold you in such high esteem. And I think that you are someone who holds other people in their life to a high regard. High standard. A high standard. Yeah. I do. Mm, makes me feel good. Not going to let people be in my life and not be what I what I believe they're capable of being. Yeah. I don't want nobody holding mm -hmm. me back. And I know what I see in you. And I know other women see in you what I see in you. And it's just like, <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> I landed that by myself, this mentally ill female did the work, upgraded, leveled up, and now I get to call him daddy. <laughs> I love my life. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me and I'm getting nervous. <laughs> On the outside, I look like this. On the inside... I am fainting on a grand staircase super slowly in my very elegant robe with feathers on the sleeves. <laughs> if you guys haven't guessed where I'm going with this, it's the pedestaling. It's the I'm 15 years old and I'm finding a daddy. It's a little bit of dynamic confusion because, look, I've practiced BDSM for 13 years now, going on 13 years, I think it's been, right? Like I was 21 when I got introduced into the community and I'm 34. Is that 13 years? I don't know how to do math. So I've been in it a long time. I was like formally mentored by a woman in leather. I believe in traditional BDSM roles. I like them. I don't think they're the end all be all. I think anything works for anybody. But again, I think they're saying they're BDSM without saying they're BDSM. And so I've seen a lot of this in BDSM relationships. And often it is a yellow slash red flag in terms of where you are in recovery for your mental illnesses, where women who are mentally ill will idealize the man and the man will be this like pedestaled older guy who like saves the girl. And there's something about it that just like makes me uncomfortable, right? But the next clip I'm going to show you is going to solidify why I'm uncomfortable. 
So once again, I am not saying these are bad people. I'm saying what I have noticed in terms of where people are in their recovery. She'll say like, I'm still mentally ill. I'm a mess. Borderline is awful. And I have borderline too. But like when you're in recovery, there is a place I even used to be. So don't let me project. When I was using BDSM as a major cope, for my therapy, even though I have, I always knew it wasn't therapy. I knew it was just therapeutic. I was going to therapy. I knew it wasn't therapy. But sometimes we forget like just because you're at your happiest doesn't mean you're actually at your healthiest. And for some reason when they talk, it feels like they're saying I'm very happy but I'm not healthy. But they're selling themselves as content creators, which is totally fine. I think this is very normal and very okay. I used to do this too of people who are like – um more upgraded than they are. And then they're basically saying like, you are less than me. She's saying I upgraded. And so I earned this man. But again, there's something about that that like makes me feel icky. When again, for me, when I look at my partner and myself, it's more like we're two individuals that are really awesome. And we came together and have this really great marriage. But I don't look up to him on a pedestal. He doesn't look up to me on a pedestal. Like we are peers. Like I don't feel like, oh, I did it. I upgraded. I earned this man. It's more like, Nope, we're both just like competent adults who decided to get married because we're good and compatible. So again, I don't like the idea of like pedestaling your partners. I feel like mm, there's something about that that seems really off, right? And so again, like for me, I'm not, I really don't want my content to come across like I really think everyone, everyone is like worse off or I just want to say like this is why I was feeling a little bit like mm, sussy about their content. So, okay, that's the first part of it, right? The original TikTok we saw was a woman who was saying, hey, if a man pedestals you, he feels like, I can't believe I won this woman. I won the prize. There's something about that that's toxic. This is happening in their relationship too, where she's saying, I've won the prize as if she wasn't worthy. And in a previous video we saw of them, she kept take res taking responsibility for his alleged cheating in a hypothetical, not that he really cheated, but in a hypothetical. And look, I know women like to take credit for men's accomplishments, but for their cheating, let's not take accountability for that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> let's let them have that accomplishment all on their own. How about that? Now, one last thing is that I see this in a lot of dangerous dynamics, a lot of toxic dynamics where the man will always say, I am there to save the mentally ill woman. Look at this mentally ill woman who needs me to guide her. Oh yes, I need a strong man to guide me through my mental illness. You need a therapist and you need a relationship with your consciousness. You do not need a strong man to guide you through your mental illness. And I think this narrative is really, really contradictory to recovery because, again, if the relationship is built on this codependency, or that's probably the wrong word, is built off this dynamic, then what happens when everyone's healed? What happens when everyone is on the other side of their recovery, right? What is the dynamic then? And again, it's separate from a BDSM dynamic, which can be healthy and have um, a dynamic of like top and bottom, submissive and dominant, master slave. So again, I understand there's a separation of BDSM and the separation from a healthy relationship. Healthy or toxic relationships can practice BDSM. I obviously recommend you practice BDSM in a healthy relationship. And if you start off toxic, I hope you aim for healthy. But let's look at this last clip from them, which I also stood out to me. You know, before being in a relationship with you, I would have never thought to take a man's boots off. No. Mm -mm. Never crossed my mind. Do you think that that's because it's it it's just frowned upon? Like it's just like why would I do that? He's a grown man; he can do it himself. Like, that's the mindset. I I could definitely attribute that mindset to it. Yeah, I also didn't see anybody as worthy of it. Hmm. That's a good word, worthy. Yeah, I know what I am. I know what I bring to the table. I know what I look like. Being able to experience this, taking boots off. Yeah, you have to be something special. <laughs> and wink. And wink. <laughs> did I do it? Did I wink? You didn't. I mean, you did, but it was. It's so hard for me to do it. Usually I just blink. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you had to talk yourself up to it. Yeah, and without wink. the narration, it's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> you can see me say it in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, you want to see? <laughs> <laughs> Your eyebrows came up first. It was choreographed. <laughs> Told you. Oh, man. I love that she's challenging people in her life with this information, too. Like, she's not yeah. backing down from things anymore. Right. That's rediscovering a new self-worth. That's dope. You know, before being in a relationship with you, I would have never thought to take a man's boots off. No. Mm -mm. 
Never crossed my mind. We're just listening again. Do you think that that's because it's it it's just frowned upon? Like it's just like why would I do that? He's a grown man; he can do it himself. Like, that's the mindset. I I could definitely attribute that mindset. Hold that one more time. It. Yeah. I also didn't see anybody as worthy of it. Hmm. That's a good word, worthy. Yeah. I know what I am. I know what I bring to the table. I know what I look like. Okay, multiple things. What does she mean when she says, I know what I look like? Is she saying she's really hot or is she saying she's really ugly? Like, I can't tell the difference here in her tone. Two, what do you mean worthy to take off your man's boots? In a BDSM dynamic, this is a thing. And I'm all for it in the BDSM world. But like in regular vanilla world, what does this have to do with real life, right? And again, I was trained by BDSMers who I feel like have a really healthy balance between like what they call real life and lifestyle. Because look, when you're in the lifestyle, the BDSM lifestyle, it can be 24 seven, but like real life happens. You don't always have time to take off people's boots. Let's go, let's go. We have to get food on the table. We have to do things. So again, when I see this dynamic, something in the way she talks about him and he lets her talk about him makes me feel like they're not peers and they're not equal, which all of a sudden takes off my red flags, which is why I don't like age gap relationships because every age gap relationship I've seen, most of them always have the relationship where the younger person is sort of supposed to worship the older person or the older person worships the younger person. And either way, it's not about being peers. It's about them constantly making it clear they're not the same. And that makes me feel like, mm, that's a little strange. And again, these are real people with real lives. So I really don't want to like sit here and be like, they're awful people. I'm just saying I'm, I don't like it. And I feel like this is why I can't love their content because I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what is the message you're putting out there? Now, apparently, some of you guys said in the last time I uh, reviewed them that they kind of get upset that they'll clip the most salacious parts of their podcast and then be surprised people are mad at them, which I understand. As a content creator, you want to get the clicks. But then at the same time, it's like, mm, what does this mean? You know, Discord says she has such a false sense of good self-esteem. It's like she's trying to prove something to herself. That's how I feel. I feel like every time this woman talks, she is trying to prove something to herself instead of it actually being true, which coincides with Wednesday's podcast. How do you know you're actually introspective and how do you know when you're coping, right? There's a specific thing that happens when you're being introspective, right? It's what I talked about tomfoolery with. There's a real change in you. How do you know you've changed and how do you know you're just not coping? And that's a very specific journey. I already wrote down, like I have the like little bullet points written out. I'm really stoked to cover it with you guys on Wednesday. And then on top of that, the week after that, the podcast is going to be about, um, is it your borderline or are you actually just right about the people you're observing? Because a lot of the time when you have borderline, which these two people do, and I do myself, you run the, the two relationships with borderline, right? The first part of it where you're getting therapy and you're doing DBT and you feel so much better. You feel like, holy shit, how can it get better than this? And then you actually get into remission or recovery and you're like, oh, it, it gets so much better. And then on top of that, that's separate from introspection as a journey going all the way to what I call a level five if you want to or a level two who has joy. So the week after this Wednesday, next week's podcast is going to be about you know, when you have borderline, people will tell you, oh, you're just getting the bad vibe about person. Oh, you're misunderstanding them. You're blowing it up because you have borderline. But then their actions prove you right. And then you have to ask yourself, fuck, am I right? Or do I just have borderline where I always think this of people? And this is what I have to say about myself. Like, am I getting a yellow flag from these people because of my previous like life experience? Or am I literally watching them and going, oh, wait, I know what this is because it holds the same pattern. A false sense of security, a false sense of understanding the self, and a blowing up of ego. There's a lot of ego in this channel, a lot of them boasting that they're rich and recovered or figured out stuff. They talk about how life is hard, but they for me, kind of plant a false seed within themselves, which is why she's always crying on the podcast. Like she cries a lot. And for me, this is a red flag because like I cry a lot, but I don't cry like she cries a lot. She cries a lot. And it feels to me like she's still so much in recovery. I don't know if she did DBT. I don't know if she's in the finalized stages of it. I don't know how much she needed. We all need different levels of therapy. Some people need one session. Some people need 300. Everyone is on a different journey, right? So I'm not here to say she has to do it one way or specifically, but something about the way they're dynamic is feels sort of like it's gonna crumble like I don't know how long they'll last as a couple even though they're married and they don't believe in divorce something about the way they talk about their relationship feels strange to me like it doesn't feel right or like 
oh, do you think like people just don't like that you take off my boots because it's frowned upon? No, because it's not efficient. It doesn't make sense for real life. It's totally a kinky fantasy or it's a lifestyle fantasy. It has nothing to do with real life. This is just a thing specifically for people in specific dynamics. Taking off your partner's shoes is so outside the norm because it's literally inefficient. It makes no sense for people to spend time taking off their partner's shoes or wiping their ass when we have all of life to live. But if you want to take a pause and be kinky and have a level of intimacy that's that's conveyed through this taking off of boots, then I get it. But in real life, outside of curating a moment, that's like saying, oh, do you think it's people just think it's weird that you suck my dick every 15 seconds? It's like, yeah, because it's kind of a waste of time, bro. We have to do stuff. But if you want to have a dynamic where this happens all the time, then it's kind of like you are you are making the emphasis like you are saying we're going to make an emphasis on this intimacy, but it's not something that needs to be earned and it's not something outside of your dynamic. So sometimes I don't know if they realize that through their content, if they are speaking to a specific bubble, like who outside of BDSM has time to take off their partner's boots? Like who literally has time for this? You know what I mean? I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it. You know what I mean? You said they didn't feel like partners first time around. And yeah, there's a distance there. Yeah, something about their dynamic seems very strange to me. But also, weirdly enough, in their other TikToks, they're kind of like teenagers. That's what's so funny. In their podcast, they don't feel like a couple. But then she does this. And I'm like, oh, they feel like teenagers. And then I'll watch their other TikToks again, no judgment. And they're like doing teenage TikToks. Like cuddling and being a little too like PDA for me personally. And maybe that's just me. And again, my bubble, my problems. But like... And then I'll watch their other TikToks and I'm like, oh, they're kind of like teenagers. And then I'm like, why do I think this of them? There's a certain type of relationship that I categorize as like a young relationship. Now, they've only been together, I think, like three years, which is fine. What's time? Right. But there's something in the way they dynamic together that makes me wonder, like, are they like, is this going like, how is this going to work long term? Like, I can't for some reason see it, but it must they, they seem happy. So, like, again, I don't want to like that's. You know what I'm saying? But I'm. it's the way they talk about it. Like, what is the foundation of the relationship on? They keep saying values, but I'm not sure what that means. And they keep saying tradition, but like, okay, I grew up in a traditional religious home and like nobody had time to take off nobody's boots. Tradition in what? BDSM? Then sure. Right? Like, if you mean tradition in terms of BDSM, sure. But what is the brand really saying? What are they trying to convey? Right? So again, no judgment. They seem nice enough. I just, that's what stood out to me yesterday. I was like, oh, that's what it is. It feels like two pedestoli, okay, to sum it up. They put each other on pedestals in a weird way, specifically her to him, okay? They create a dynamic in which they brag about being somewhere other people aren't, which is true. They've reached a money limit, like understanding of themselves. They have an understanding with their mental health. But something in the way they're conveying it tells me like, I don't know if it's as healthy as they're pretending it is right with the way she cries on stream and, and pedestals him and at the same time even the way she talks about taking off his boots as something she's like earned outside of bdsm this would be a very abnormal conversation because it makes no sense outside of a dynamic it just doesn't you know what i mean so i don't know for me that's where my weirdness comes in okay well to be honest my self-esteem is not great so my brain can't wrap my head around that people are actually interested in me yeah, like you, that's something that would definitely be difficult to work on, right? And at the same time, you don't want to have such false self-esteem that you're like, how could people not be into me, right? You want to have a real relationship with your consciousness, like an honest relationship with yourself. So you can say, oh, I can see why people hate me. And I can also see why people love me. And I can also see why people don't vibe with me. And I can also tell the difference between when people don't vibe with me and when I'm the problem, right? Because there is a complete difference. There's infatuation with your partner and then there's making them your savior. Very different. Total agree. That's the vibe I'm getting from this relationship that makes me uncomfortable. It's, it feels like he's like almost like a savior. You know what I mean? Um, there's something there, you know? Okay, hold on. I'm looking at Discord. Your reaction to to be better was pretty much what I expected. I was just enthusiastic to have your perspective. Yeah, I mean, apparently, I don't know how many of you guys watch them, but apparently plenty of you watch them. And again, I don't want anyone to think that I'm sitting here like a person who doesn't even know them 
criticizing their relationship. I'm just saying for me in my bubble, this is the reason I'm getting yellow red flags. It's like there's certain ways people talk about their partners that make me go, hmm. It's the same way when a man talks about his partner as being like stupid or young or inexperienced or naive. And I'm like, oh, why are we talking about our partners this way? So when she talks about her partner, I was like, I did that. As a mentally ill woman, I got this, the prize. And I'm like, cringe like ew like there's something very icky about that like there's something very off about that for me there's just something very off I only want a man to control me in the bedroom I mean you know you know oof there are times where this is discord there are times where I'm being a bit strange and I think wow someone loves me but it's humorous to me not lacking in self-esteem I think that that difference is really key right introspection I wonder how worthy could be taken into consideration. Yeah, I want to know too, right? Worthy for me doesn't tick worship, feels the opposite, feels really harsh hierarchy wise, but I am for sure sometimes I do have the tendency towards people in a higher position in hierarchy, AKA they have to prove they are worthy of that position. Otherwise I do not trust them. Mm. It could be something like that where she feels like he's worthy of her taking off someone's boots and she never would have thought about doing that. Like, I've obviously thought about taking off someone's boots since I was 15 because, like, obviously I've been reading about BDSM and lifestyle and vampires since I was a kid. And so obviously when I was 21 and joined and now I'm 34, obviously I've taken off lots of people's boots. Okay, well, that's a, that's a lie. I've taken off one person, two person's boots, two people, two doms, um, their boots, one I was a bottom and servicing as a submissive. And then when I was a submissive to this dom and I would take off their boots, of course. And now I'm not in a DS relationship. So I don't have a DS dynamic. You know, no one's taken off anyone's boots, but it only exists within BDSM. Like again, I couldn't even imagine vanilla people having this relationship. So it'd be kind of funny to me if they started doing it. But even so, a lot of toxic relationships will keep people hostage. It's like, you're not worthy. You have to be worthy. You have to be worthy. You have to be worthy. And it's like, okay, it's not about worthy. It's about compatibility. And I think the way you dispel the ego is to say, not that I am better than everyone else. Like, I don't want to, you know, there's this narrative I've heard from people where some people have said like, oh, am I not good enough to date you? And I'm like, it's not about good enough. It's about compatibility, bro. This idea, if I went around saying like, you're not good enough to date me, I'm putting the onus on my ego. I'm saying my ego is so big, I think you are not worthy of dating me versus, um, yeah, dude, I just don't think we're compatible. Like you seem like a nice person, but it's not a vibe, right? So I think there's something here in the way that they're talking that makes me think like, I don't know if they're doing the separation of those two realities. I don't know if they're recognizing like he goes, oh, I hold people to a high standard. I expect people to do better. I and it's like, sir, you wouldn't even reach my standard, though. Like they wouldn't even reach my standard. So what is the standard we're creating? We're creating a false concept of standard. Everybody thinks they have a high standard. I think they I have a high standard. They think they have a high standard. I'm told I have a high standard. I feel like their standard isn't high enough for me because I expect a certain level of awareness in terms of introspection that I'm not seeing from their content, but then I would be in my ego if I actually thought that was a real idea. It's not real, it's a construct created by the ego. So my bubble tells me I have a higher standard, but I don't have a higher standard. I have a standard for Britney, and that is not a higher standard for the rest of the world, but I wonder if they realize that. I wonder if they realize that you don't have higher standards, you just have standards that are specific to you. And that's the difference. Again, when you claim, oh, I have higher standards and that's why I can't just be sleeping with anybody. No, what you have is specific standards. I would argue they should be healthy standards, which you could argue is is higher standards. But I would just say like specific standards. Even when I'm talking to Tom Foolery about other content creators, it's like Britney standards. I, I really wanna put into my vocabulary Britney standards, not higher standards, Britney standards. Because again, if I allow myself to think, oh, I have such high standards, I'm gonna forget that my standards are lower to somebody else. To somebody else, my standards aren't high enough. To my own religious family, I don't have high enough standards because I'm pro-nude work, I'm pro-sex work, right? So what does it mean to have high standards? It's not, it's a construct. It's, a, it's an idea that was curated through the ego to make yourself feel like you are better than who? Your past self and maybe even the people around you. So yeah, for me, that's a part of the issue that I have around this content, you know? I like the idea of them saying they believe in elevating each other, but it's weird for her to say that he's basically blessed with her. With his, He's basically blessed her with his presence in spite of her mental illness. Like, who the fuck is he? That's exactly, right? It's like, sir, I don't know. 
Real life, helping people take off their boots and shoes is a kindness, not something to be worthy of. Interesting, never thought about it that way, but I could see that. She feels insecure to me. That's my worry. My worry is that very insecure people will enter into relationships like this, and then the person automatically gets the security of being better than their partner because their other partner is so insecure and, and whatever that there's like a cycle they're feeding into, right? Where she, because she's so insecure, feeds his sense of ego and security, and then it fits this dynamic. But what if she stops being insecure? What happens when she stops being insecure? What happens when she stops being insecure? That's what I wanna know. That's what I wanna know. What happens to the relationship the moment she gets better and healthier, right? Their content's called To Be Better. What happens? when she gets better. That's what I want to know. Now, obviously with her journey, she said it multiple times, like she's the happiest she's ever been, even as a mentally ill person. Borderline is still an issue in her life. And all of that makes sense. I remember, I really do remember after getting some DBT and doing some therapy, thinking like, oh my God, I'm so much better. But there really is a cycle. There's a cycle to being, there's a healing process to getting therapy and getting diagnosed, recognizing you have a problem, doing the like doing the steps and then actually getting to the point where you're just in remission and you're just in maintenance. Truly being in maintenance is a very different experience and she's not obviously there yet, but that's okay because that's a journey and it takes time. I don't know when she was diagnosed. I don't know how long it's been. I don't know how much philosophy she's reading. I don't know how much she's like meditating on the consciousness, but it is, it makes sense to me that she's still in the process of recognizing and having a relationship with her borderline. But what happens when she gets there? What happens to the relationship in the dynamic once she gets there? Because I assume she will get there, right? He's loving the fact that she's dependent on him. He loves that she thinks he's so wise and he, he, so he's not going to correct her. That's my fear. That is taking them at their worst. So at their worst, that's what's happening. At their best, they're both just damaged enough and in re, like in um, they're on their recovery journey at a place where they are they are meshing together in a way that sort of makes sense, right? So again, maybe they're just at a place in their relationship where this is what makes sense for them. But at their worst, there is a fear that, yeah, like that might be happening technically. But I don't know. I don't want to put that accusation on them, right? Because I don't have any re reason to think that. But that is my fear, right? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm seeing level two-ness in people nowadays and kind of disliking that I'm seeing it. Girl. Just remember that like humans are going to human and like radically accepting that is really about you, right? <clears throat> it's really about us. And we're all there. We all have bubbles. We all have biases, you know? Wait, aren't they both divorced from a previous relationship? Maybe? Uh, would make sense. I think they both come from hard backgrounds, right? I think she has a kid. I don't know much about them other than that. From what I understand, a good dom would address his sub if they were stressed and exhausted just as much as a sub would take off a dom's boots after work. It just sounds one-sided. Maybe, you know, you know, everyone has a different DS relationship. Everyone does BDSM differently. Everyone has a romantic relationship differently. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't know what exactly is going on. But again, I've just watched clips. I've tried to go through their TikToks. I've watched like, I don't know, 30 of them. And I'm just not... I'm not seeing, I don't know. It's again, everyone's at a different stage of recovery and they might just be making content for the people they are now. And that's great. And in 10 years, they'll be making different content or whatever, you know, it reminds me of beauty and the beast when Gaston is, uh, sings to Belle and puts his dirty feet or dirty boots on the table and about how she would take off his boots. Oh yeah. I totally forgot about that. Actually. I wouldn't want to constantly prove myself to my partner that I'm worthy of them. At least that's the vibe I'm getting. I wonder if she's constantly worried he'll leave. Well, I think they believe they keep saying they're traditional and they don't believe in divorce. So actually I don't think so. I think from my understanding, they are not getting divorced, but I also wonder how that's going to play out a little bit. Yeah. Because I, again, my partner and I don't believe in divorce except for abuse reasons. And we would consider cheating abuse. But in their hypothetical about cheating, she turned around and said, if you ever cheated, it would be because I contributed to it. Like I didn't give you a space. So I would be failing as a wife, which makes me go red flag again. Why are you taking responsibility for his cheating? Just because somebody hurts you doesn't mean it justifies you hurting somebody else, which is the irony of the bubbles. I swear to God, everybody would be like, Brittany, don't you think it's fair? I hurt them. They hurt me first. And I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds super wise and introspective. You're definitely meditating. Do you hear yourselves? 
Like, do you hear yourself? Look, I'm not the calmest bitch in the room, but let me tell you, you know what the least introspective thing is to do? They hurt me so I get to hurt them. Talk about little to no introspection. Think about what you're saying out loud. Oh yes, it makes sense you cheated. I created an environment in which you cheated. No, it makes sense in which you had the thoughts to cheat, but the action of cheating itself was on you. I can understand why you doubted the relationship enough to have the intrusive thought of maybe I should cheat, but I also need you to take accountability for the fact that you pursued the action and accomplished it. Like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible, okay? Right, that was Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible. I never watched them. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes, you can say that as a partner, you need to create an environment to allow your partner to come tell you things that hurt your feelings. But at the end of the day, your partner is still responsible for the bad actions they take because two wrongs do not make a right. I'm sorry, didn't we all learn that in kindergarten? Well, apparently not, right? Facts, revenge is low introspection. Thank you, Kay, exactly. It's like, sir, ma'am, no, absolutely not. You know, absolutely not. Ugh. I would need to feel like my partner is worthy to dom me. Like I need to trust, I need that trust to build up. I would say, um, again, when we say worthy, we're kind of, when we say deserve, we're putting ourselves on a pedestal. So when Boogie says, I deserve LA-10s, I deserve that, I'm worthy of that. What we're saying is like, I'm putting myself on a pedestal that should get this thing versus, or they should get this thing. So I would say my wording is, I would like to have a person with good character who I can trust to um, treat me with dignity. That's how I would reframe it now. But in the past, I would say things like worthy and deserve and these words that are just very ego driven versus I would like somebody with a good sense of character who would treat me with dignity and I could treat them with dignity and it could be a symbiotic relationship of dignity, right? Because again, putting your, it's very hard not to put yourself on a pedestal or put somebody else on a pedestal. It's really hard not to say like, you're not good enough. These men aren't good enough. These women aren't good enough. It's not about being good enough. It's about saying, I'm not finding something that matches with me. And unless you think you are literally the bee's knees, unless you literally think you were the greatest thing created by God, I don't know that anyone needs to be worthy of you so much as they need to, like entitlement words. Yes, Kay. They're all entitlement words that I want to move away from, but it really boosts the ego. Look at the way he like, look at the, look at this dynamic. Look at, look at this dynamic. You know, before being in a relationship with you, I would have never thought to take a man's boots off. No. Okay, so she never thought to take a man's boots off, which means I assume she did not grow up BDSM. I assume he's the reason they're now BDSM, yes? And how old is their age difference? I want to know. So, okay, am I getting that right? She never thought to take a man's boots off, which I assume means she wasn't BDSM before she met him. Mm -mm. Never crossed my mind. Do you think that that's because it's it it's just frowned upon? Like it's just like okay. Now it feels like he's a little bit fishing for an answer. Do you think it's just frowned upon, sir? In what reality is anyone taking off their partner's shoes outside of being a beautiful, like caring moment? Like my partner's sick today, let me help them. There, no one's doing this in a dynamic unless their partner is sick and unwell. And then of course we're taking off shoes. Of course we're tucking our partners into bed because we're caring about our partners. But you're not talking about that. He's not talking about taking off your partner's boots out of care. You're saying taking out my partner's boots out of a sign of what? Submission and what they deem as respect. So like, don't play like this is so weird. Oh, don't you think it's so, why would it be so weird? Cause it is weird, sir. And this is coming from a BDSMer. Like I'm not even like, I'm saying it's so not introspective about the differences between lifestyle and non-lifestyle. Just like, why would I do that? He's a grown man. He can do it. Why would I do that? He's a grown man. You're right. Outside of a BDSM dynamic, why would you do that? You are a grown man. It makes no sense. But himself. Like That's the mindset. I, I could definitely attribute that mindset to it. Yeah. I also didn't see anybody as worthy of it. Hmm. That's a good word, worthy. Yeah. I know what I am. I know what I bring to the table. I know what I look like. What does that mean? I know what I look like. I still don't even know what this is about. Are both of them just so into themselves? Like, is she saying she's literally ugly or she's saying she's very, very hot? What is she saying? Why do women say this? I know what I, I know what I'm, I don't deserve the Cheesecake Factory. Look how hot I am. I don't even know what any of you are talking about. Okay. First of all, everyone is ugly. Watch my latest podcast. Okay. What is, what is beauty? Like, what is she saying? What is she saying? What is the conversation that is being had? I know what I'm worth. I know what I look like. Ma'am, what are we talking about here?
What are we literally talking about here? What are they saying? Is this just a podcast where they boost each other's ego and tell their viewers, like, follow us, we're awesome? Like, what is happening? I'm sorry, I'm being so critical. I just, so many red flags to me. Like, what is she saying? What is she saying? You know? Hot enough to not take off any other man's shoes till her current guy. This couple is perfect for each other. Actually, touche. <laughs> Okay, touche, right? Like maybe they are perfect for each other because they boost each other's ego constantly. I don't know. For me, it's just like, if I ever talked like this, this would be, it was a red flag. If I, I did in my twenties, I have content where I'm talking very similar to this, but different. And I remember thinking like, oh, that Brittany had no clue. She was still like in recovery in a very big way. You know what I mean? <laughs> See, Brittany was right. Couples got a match. They do got a match. Yeah, I could never, I could never fuel this man's ego the way she's doing it. And I could never, like, if I went to my partner and I was like, I know what I look like. I'm so hot. He'd be like, girl, humble yourself, bitch. And I'm like, you humble yourself, bitch. Like we, I do not want an ego-driven relationship. I do not want an ego-driven relationship. I want a hum, like humility-based relationship. I want a relationship that's based off of our character and not the shallowness of like what we look like. And yes, did I did I work out today? I did. Thank you very much. Is my back looking fine? Yes, it is. Thank you for asking. Is my butt looking great? It is. Thank you for asking. But I would like, it's not about that. You know what I mean? Could she mean she understands herself? Maybe. Let's go back. Because it's, it, it's just frowned upon. Like, it's just like, why would I do that? He's a grown man. He can do it himself. Like That's the mindset. I, I could definitely attribute that mindset to it. Yeah. I also didn't see anybody as worthy of it. Hmm. That's a good word, worthy. Yeah. I know what I am. I know what. No, I'm... she's putting herself on a pedestal. I also didn't see anybody as worthy of it. Hmm. That's a good word, worthy. Yeah. I know what I am. I know what I bring to the table. I know what I look like. Being able to experience this, taking boots off. Yeah, you have to be something special. Yeah, she's putting herself on a pedestal. It's not just saying I know who I am. She's putting herself on a pedestal and you know what I mean? Which is not a, like, I'm not upset you put yourself on a pedestal, but I do think it lacks introspection to put yourself on a pedestal, right? It doesn't make any sense. I low key want to watch the entire podcast of this delusional couple. I don't even know if they're, whatever they are, they're obviously complimentary. Again, I don't want to be too critical as I know they're real people, but it's like fascinating. Look at the comments. Hold on. Can you guys see the comments? Uh, when you truly love and respect each other, you want to do these things for each other. You want to please one another. Maybe, I guess. Um, seriously, these two, every time I see them, I'm here for it. Book worthy. This man loves his woman, but I feel like it's a little moments like this that make him fall for her all over. What what happened? What did I miss? I used to take my grandfather's boots off for him as a child every time I was at his house. And when he'd come home for work, I did it for years. Um... I don't think I could ever see myself doing that for anyone else. If my partner needed to help, help taking his boots off, I would though. Same, grandpa always gave me a quarter for doing it. See, now are we co like, are we relating things I do for my grandpa with things I do for my husband? Like, this is interesting to me, right? I don't know about that. Um, I love it when you guys laugh together. Important to be silly. My lady used to take off my boots until I got my new job working in trash. So now... We change it to where she takes my bag once I get home and unpacks it for me. Okay, this is all dynamic stuff, right? This is all dynamic stuff. and Everybody has a unique dynamic in their relationship. But again, okay, this is a dynamic and it's fine. But not everybody like lives up to it in this way. So I just want to make it clear, like, do they know that? I just want to know how self-aware they are to know that they know that, right? That this is a construct, like saying like, oh, making someone worthy or like, oh, society just has a stigma against it. It's like, yeah, society would have a stigma against anything that's like not expected. So you're creating something that's unique to you and that's okay. But it is interesting. Oh, Israel is, excuse you me. know, before being Absolutely in a relationship. not Israel. I don't have time for negative news. Okay. I'm, I have a thing coming up about that maybe later. Okay. Um, my mom took my dad's boots off every night he got home and she would tie them up for him every morning. That's fine. Everyone expresses it differently. My mom did it for my dad. I always saw it as taking off his workload for the day. I do it for my husband. I do it if my husband doesn't kick them off at the door. 
Um, women that do are far and few in between. Her transparency is awesome. Very happy for you too. Again, you guys just know this is like a fantasy, right? Like everyone has their own fantasy, but there is a judgment that's coming with it that I think is interesting. Not necessarily from the hosts, but there is this narrative that, ooh, if people don't take off their husband's boots or do something for their husband when they get home, they're showing a sign of disrespect. And I think that this is just the part that I wanna make it clear is subjective, right? The way you express love and intimacy in your relationship is dependent on the people involved in it. And I'm not saying that these hosts aren't saying that, but the way they talk about things is the, imp the implication because they keep saying they're traditional, which again, whose tradition are you following? Because in my traditional bubble where I grew up with my parents, my mom never took off my dad's shoes. Why would she do that? Like, why would she literally do that? My dad would be like, what are you doing? Like, you're not a slave, right? Like, what are you doing? Like, ma'am, get up. Like, why is my wife on her knees taking off my shoes? Get up. You know what I mean? Everyone would look at the dynamic differently. And I just want to know, do they think this dynamic is like, a real sign or is it not? Cause like, is this comment like judging like women who do this are far and few in between? Yeah, dude, because it's like uh, kind of weird. You know, it's kind of a weird dynamic. And I don't even know whose grandpa would take, I would never take off my grandpa's shoes, ma'am. What bubble is this, right? It's a bubble, it's a cultural bubble. My boyfriend always tells me I'm the most beautiful girl in the world. And I'm like, bro, appreciate it. But you know, there's plenty of hot chicks outside there, right? And he's like, yeah, but they are not you. True based true as kids my sister and i used to take off our dad's socks when he came home from work but that's because we found his reaction funny and cute male equivalent of taking off your bra after a long day fair fair and again i'm all about helping i'm all about doing whatever is efficient for the group i just think that it's interesting that what i see in bdsm dynamics is being sort of played off of what might be normal and then what's in a cultural bubble might be seen as playing off as like normal normal is your bubble See, look at this. I've done that for years and laid his clothes out for work and I still got cheated on. And it's like, yeah, I think people have to understand it's not about what you do in a relationship. It's not what you do. It's your character. Your character reflects what you do. But if you do it to win brownie points, you're not really, it's not your character. Right? And again, this is what this week's podcast is about. And this is what I was trying to explain to Tom. You're right. It's like, just because you do the right thing doesn't mean you're doing it because it's a part of your character. And when people get with you, they're hoping it's a part of your character. So this week's podcast, right, is going to explain the difference between how do you know when someone's changed and when someone's just acting correctly until they don't act correctly anymore. And it coincides with your character. What is stopping you from doing the bad thing? Is it your character, your sense of values? Or is it because you know it's wrong according to the bubble or even you've logic your brain into thinking it's wrong, but it's not enough. And that's what I want to show people is there is a literal difference between the Britney who kept going back to a toxic relationship to try to fix it. The Britney who left the toxic relationship and never went back. And then the Britney who literally couldn't even imagine wanting it again. There is a literal difference in my character change. My whole consciousness had a shift had a complete shift in person. Ask my brother who had to watch me go from a person who's like, why didn't I make my relationship work? To, oh my God, why did I even want that relationship in the first place? Why was I even a person who wanted it? I couldn't even imagine wanting it again. It is a complete transformation of consciousness. So again, I want to warn people because people always say like, how did he cheat on me? Because it didn't matter what he said. It didn't matter how he acted. He never believed. He never had the values. He never had the character. He just played like he did, which is why the fear of dating is, how do you know what character your partner has? Now, some of you guys look at my relationship, right? Engaged after six months, okay? Married after a year. And a lot of people would say like, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? I know because of his character. I know because of his relationship with values. I know because of the way we did things. But I also know because I had learned experience. I had the tools to know more. Yes, full software update overhaul. Exactly. I knew my partner wasn't Windows 11 pretending to be Windows whatever. I knew my partner was the latest and greatest. But I knew because like we had updated our software. I don't know how to actually work with this. But like you know what I mean. I knew because I had updated I knew how to see it in somebody else. But again, a full update versus like still in process is different. Okay. 
But again, I can't explain that to people that are still in the middle of updating what the aftermath is gonna be like, right? They have no idea yet. And so when you're in the middle of it, you're like, you're not ready. I don't know how many of my callers, I tell them like, you're not ready to date anybody. You're not ready to be someone's wife or husband. And they're like, really? And I'm like, you're so desperate. You're so needy. You're drowning in your loneliness. You're not ready. If you're looking for a partner because you're lonely, you're not ready. No, you're not ready to do what I'm doing. You might be ready to do what somebody else is doing. But my partner and I certainly weren't lonely when we married each other. We were the opposite. We were so content with our lives that we chose each other because it wouldn't then create a loneliness in our lives. So many people get married and are lonely. And so again, you don't have to do what I'm doing. You can do what somebody else is doing. But what I am doing is I'm saying you need to be a person who marries somebody not out of loneliness or desperation, but out of a true connection with their consciousness, right? Because you have a real connection with your own. And you can do this as a two, you can do this as a five. You can do this in any capacity of introspection, but you still have to be at a certain level of introspection, right, in relation to yourself. I think this is really important. I think this is very specific, right? Okay, now, um, and I tell this to my siblings too, like eight, nine, seven of my siblings are not married. And I'm like, yeah, none of them are ready to be someone's partner. They're just ready to be someone's like temporary, maybe partner, maybe dating, maybe casual, but none of them are ready to be a spouse. None of them are ready to combine their life with somebody else. None of them are ready to like fight the world with somebody else. That's a very specific journey. This a very specific journey, you know what I mean? And so again, for myself, I had to ask myself, am I ready to be someone's spouse? And that is a very different game than being someone's temporary lover, being someone's boyfriend, being someone's girlfriend, being someone's temporary, like anything, right? So again, I just wanna encourage people to find their joy, but that is why ultimately I had a little bit of a yellow flag. I'm not sure uh, what any of this means for them, but I hope they're happy and healthy to be better. I hope the podcast people to be better are, Joyful. You know what I mean? Because it's a journey. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. Da, 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 da. 